Well, hello, everybody. Uh, James Donnelly uh, here at uh, Castle headquarters, and I'm joined today again by Donna Berger, who is a shareholder at Becker. And Donna, um, you're you're fresh off your huge uh, board a member boot camp yesterday. How did that go? Uh, James, it was it exceeded expectations, and I'm not going to make you refer to me as General Berger today. How that but we've got to get you try. out to one of these okay we'll give you i a will try that please. you'll look great <laughs> well uh everyone we uh have been doing so many uh, webinars um about all of the legislative changes and and specifically for the condominiums the sb4d and and uh 154 so donna and i thought it would be uh um, a good idea to take a step back and actually what these are going to do are drive a lot of projects. And then we thought, well, it doesn't matter whether you're a condominium or an HOA, you've got projects. And so what we really wanted to do what today was talk about what a board needs to consider, think about what decisions need to be made uh, for a major uh, certification or renovation or repair project. Um, Today, uh, so we really think that, our, you know, sometimes our topics kind of more condo or more HOA. I really think this is good for everyone that's on the webinar today. Our format uh, remains the same. We You send in some great questions and we've, we've shaped some of our uh, comments today in response to that. But I know that questions will come up along the way. So you can use the uh, question and answer function and I, I'm moderating. So I do have that up on my screen. I may not get to ask your question specifically, but I usually bundle them so that we can get a good answer from Donna. Um, so we all always get asked about past episodes because you know there's usually one board member on the webinar and they tell the other webinar and they say, I wanna see it. So they are all on castlegroup.com. You can go see our past episodes. Um, and if you have any questions along the way or anything we've said you want further data on, email us at uh, info at castlegroup.com. So there, there was one, uh, our agenda today is, is the um, certification uh, repair renovation projects and, and, and what a board needs to think about. But in our prep call, uh, Donna and I uh, referenced a, a federal law that was passed, Donna, the Corporate Transparency Act. And I really feel our, our boards, it's gonna impact all of our associations. And I'm not sure our, all of our boards are familiar with that. So Donna, uh, before we jump into construction uh, contracts, this applies to any uh, nonprofit or profit company in the country. M maybe to kind of give a high level, we may do a deep dive later, but what is this thing called the CTA, the Corporate Transparency Act? Yeah, it's a, it's a law, James, that was passed by Congress in 2021, and it will impact all almost all associations. So very large associations with budgets um, in excess of 5 million or more than 20, they're actually not impacted. But if you're an association that has fewer than 20 employees or a budget that is less than 5 million, your board members are going to have to register with FinCEN. And that's going to be an online form. We don't know what it's gonna look like because the form hasn't been released yet. But you've got by January 1st, 2024, associations, and again, you're right, this is throughout the country, board members are going to have to register. They're going to have to get their name. There's some information. Um, they, they are going to potentially have to get a driver's license or a passport um, because they're going to be considered what's called a beneficial owner, James, of that association. And let's just say overall, the law was designed to, to um, prevent money laundering. Um, this is part of FinCEN's criminal uh, program, and you know the feeling is that some of these associations could get swept up. I don't know if that's true or not. I do know I'm already hearing that there are some concerns about privacy and, and submitting that information. Um, again, we don't know yet. It's going to take place in 2024. And I will also say another thing. Every time the beneficial ownership changes, which means new people get on the board, You've got 30 days to update that information. If it's not updated, there can be penalties and are you, you're sitting down, possible imprisonment. So it, this is something that we're going to be talking about a lot in the coming months. You said January 24, which is only a month away. Um, is that 
in fact, the start of compliance? Or because I know we talked about this at our executive meeting on Monday, and there, the, you know, we went to get the form that's going to have to be completed so we could understand the scope, and they, they don't even have they haven't even done the form yet. You've got one year. So after January 1st, 2024, the form should be up and then you've got a year to fill it out. But then after that, you've got 30 days to update. So most associations are probably going to wait James until after that election, because those will be the new board members who will register. And then from right. that point forward, but it's going to have to be something that goes on their to-do list on an annual basis. Okay, well, we're just bringing that to you more out of an awareness. Obviously, if you have a, a management company like ours, um, you know, it's our job to make sure we we coach the board on how to do that. But I know we have a lot of self-managed communities. And I just want to make sure that this is not going to be optional. Uh, they haven't even completed the format. Not only that, I'm sure they're going to address the privacy thing. We, you know, we talked about it internally. We don't want to house our board members, uh, you know, information. So we're hoping they create a portal where you can do it directly. Um, all that to say, uh, I think, you know, we want to bring to you the, the most important current information and Donna, thank you for that. I want to, uh, jump right in, uh, to our construction and repair project administration, but I do, I always like to know and share with our audience who we have. And, uh, we have, uh, over 200 people, uh, logged in here today, Donna. So, uh, let's go, uh, Ness, let's put up poll question one. Uh, and then, Donna, while we do that, I thought the best way uh, for us to do this would be in the same order a board would, you know, from identification of project, uh, um, of what project needed to be done, to uh, do they have the authority to go ahead, to how do you specify uh, or create a specification, how do you manage it, and whatnot. So um, the, the first thing, uh, oh, and the other thing is, what I wanted to preframe is we, we consciously didn't put an engineer on this panel today because th this that'll be another webinar when we get into the technical aspects of a project. This was more how do you administer, how do you approach uh, a project uh, of this scale? Um, Ness, let's share the results so we uh, we can show our audience that who their peers are on this call today. Uh, more condominiums than HOAs, that's probably expected given the nature, but uh, it certainly applies to everybody. Um, so Don, I guess step one is, how do I even know whether I need to do a project? And and, and in my notes here, I, I thought, well, you know, sometimes it's obvious, but also obviously the uh, the new legislation is, is gonna drive some of these projects, but maybe just a quick comment, Donna, on I'm a board member, how do I even know that I need to do a project? Sure. Well, so listen, some boards are really good at, in terms of the people sitting on the board and holding office where they just, especially if there's been continuity, James, over the years, they know when it's time to do the roof, to do the painting and the waterproofing. But most associations are going to rely on the advice of professional advisors, right? They're their engineer, their structural engineer, their roofing consultant, what have you. They're going to consult uh, the reserve study. So they should have a pretty good idea when the estimated remaining useful life of the roof is, or the painting, or the painting, or the seawall. So they should, and then now, as you mentioned, with the new laws and the structural integrity reserve study for structural components, they should know when they need to do certain projects. I would add to that, Donna, you know, the, the reserve studies that we do in our HOAs and our condos, these are professionals that are estimating the life of each component of, your, of, of the building or community. I mean, that is a good guide. It doesn't mean because it's the eighth year and it has an eight year use of life, they have to do it. But at a minimum, you should be looking at that asset to determine whether it's time. You don't want to wait too long or it actually could make the project even larger. Um, so, well, that's okay, a really good we, point. I build on that, James, for one quick second, because that's actually come up where members have pushed back there's nothing that says if you've got four years left on your roof, but you'd like to get it done, in, you know, two years in, go ahead and do it. That, that's quite okay. You do not need to wait until the last moment, because as you said, you can have an issue not only with you know, supply and demand that there's only so many roofers out there at any given time, but you've also got the issue of insurance, which we've talked about before. 
our insurance companies are looking to make sure that associations are regularly and consistently maintaining and repairing their, their buildings. Well, that is a uh, that's a great point. In fact, right here at Castle, we own this building, and um, it's you know the roof is supposed to last twenty years. We we actually have reserves for twenty years, and we were starting to get a lot of repair bills. And we talked to the roofing company, and we made the decision to do it two years early, and and save all the repair work that was going to happen in those two years. So, okay. Um. So now, uh, and, and again, I mean, there's all kinds of different reasons why uh, we think we need to do a project, but you know, obviously too many to address here. Now we have identified the need. One of the things that I, I think would be really helpful for our boards, Don, is does the board have the authority to do that project? And, you know, is it a material change? You know, what kind of vote, what kind of authority does the board need or can they just do it? So I've rarely, rarely seen any set of documents, James, that puts handcuffs on boards when it comes to maintenance. But alterations are a different thing. So when a when a board comes to me and they're talking about a concrete restoration project or a roofing project or painting, one of the first questions association council has to ask is, is there an alteration component to what I need to do? Let's take concrete restoration, for instance. That's pure maintenance, okay? And typically the board alone can, can, that's actually one of their main functions is to maintain, repair, and replace the common elements or the common areas in an HOA. So you will normally, that's a board decision alone. But a lot of times a board may also say, you know what, as long as we're doing the concrete restoration, we want to get rid of those, those concrete knee walls on the balconies and we want to put in beautiful glass, you know, different railings. Now you're talking about an alteration component so you need to check and see if the board alone has that authority or if they need membership approval. Now, sometimes the documents are tied to a monetary threshold. So the board can make certain alterations below a certain dollar amount. And once it gets above a dollar amount, they'll need membership approval. So this is really a, a discussion that needs to be had every time you're doing a large repair or maintenance project, because a lot of boards, and this is natural, they're thinking as long as we have to do all this, it's going to cost a lot of money. Let's freshen the look, right? But that's a whole different ballgame in terms of approval. That would be a material change and obviously driven by their documents. But I think we're going to reference this quite a bit as we walk through the life of a project. I mean, everything we do in, in association world is document driven. I mean, it's also statutorily driven, but we, we really need to get some good guidance you know, from council on, on whether we need any other authority. Donna, we had a question come in, in, in during this conversation. What if a useful life of a roof is 20 years and, and we've passed the useful life? Is there any liability on the board for not doing repairs that you know are, as an example, uh, time sensitive as shown in a reserve study? Well, I always say this, you know, Owners can find, usually can find an attorney to sue the board for a variety of reasons, okay? And we're seeing that a lot with water leaks. So we've got an insurance company out there, I won't name them, that every time one of their insureds has a water leak in the unit, they turn around, they sue the association, and what do they call Lack of maintenance. So I understand the motivation for the question, James, which is, hey, we've got a 21-year-old roof. It's technically past its estimated remaining useful life, but it's watertight, right? But I will tell you what will likely happen is if there is a leak in one of the units, um, plaintiff's counsel will use the fact that you're past the estimated remaining useful life under that reserve schedule, and they'll use that to, to demonstrate um, negligence on the part of the board. And the same may be true for the insurance company. If you had a loss, if there was a windstorm, they may say this is a lack of maintenance. You were past the, the remaining useful life. So that's definitely something that the board needs to discuss and discuss with council. Look, I have one board. The roof is 58 years old <laughs> and it's still functioning. And I said, how do you have insurance? But, you know, I think they're doing the roofing project today. It's a great question, but I do think you need yourself open to plaintiff's counsel making an argument that you know that you're negligent by not by not replacing the roof at the end of the useful life. Yeah, I think um, I think this is a really highly relevant 
discussion given what's happening all at one time is insurance rates are going up. The new legislation is driving inspections that will drive reserves, that will drive more funding. And all of a sudden, there's this uh, perfect storm of impact on the budgets of especially condominiums. And uh, so the poor boards, like, you know, what, where are they going to get the money and what, how are they going to prioritize those jobs? And uh, I think, you know, one priority may be to do X and not the roof in this example. And and is there liability? But I, I, you often reference the, you know, the good judgment business rule of of, of a board. I think as long as they stick to that, um, they're going to be in, in good stead from a liability perspective. Well, well, James, so, you know, towards that point, I'm a lot of priorities right now. A lot of associations are still operating old, under the old uh, rule book, which is aesthetic projects. You know, the aesthetic projects are, are, are sexier. People don't like the new look. But then what we're dealing with, with insurance premiums and the new uh, reserve funding mandates and the engineering, you may have to put your aesthetic projects on the back burner. Because as you said, there's only so much money to go around. So it may be the maintenance and repair projects that have to take priority in the next couple of years. It's not fun. It's not sexy, but it, you know, it is, it, you do have to prioritize right now. Yeah. Uh, let's, uh, I'd like to see from our audience, what, what kind of projects they, uh, they've got coming up. Uh, Ness, please put a poll question. Uh, oh, well, let's find out whether inspections are taking place now. Poll question two um, for now, Ness. And uh, while they're doing that, interestingly, Donna, I, I, as you know, I, I I live in a high rise condo, and um, and we're going through this exact same process. Insurance rates have doubled. Our building's twenty years old, um, and you know the uh, it, it needs to be waterproofed. And we just had a a big special assessment that um, you know my portion of which uh, was a significant number. Um, so it, what's interesting is you know you and I talk theoretically from time to time, but I, I'm literally living it right mm -hmm. now. Okay, so uh, what we've done is um, we have now identified uh, what authority. Now we have to um, figure out, we've identified we need to, I guess we might as well keep going with the roof project just because we started it. I don't know anything about roofs. How do I get specifications? Do I hire an, uh, an engineer? How do I put together an RFP? Uh, maybe just give us some preliminary talks. We may dive in a little bit on what's the next step. Okay, I got a project, but how do I get that in, mm -hmm. in, in a form that I can get bids? Sure. So the first step is how do I find the, the contractor I need, whether it's concrete restoration, whether it's roof, uh, whether it's painting and waterproofing. This is where your industry comes um, into play, James, which is often management. You know, a company like Castle, you dealt with a lot of these contractors. So you may have a referral for your boards. Same thing with, with um, the legal industry. We can certainly tell you who we're in litigation with right now. Um, we dealt with all of these vendors as well. Where do you find the vendor? Where do you find these contractors? Some people find them at trade shows, word of mouth, references. You're going to want to do your due diligence, okay? You're going to want to, you know, if they give you references, call them. Um, you know, maybe do a civil court docket search to see if they're in litigation. Ask your management company, ask your lawyer what they think about this particular contractor. Um, you may have RFPs sent out. So a lot of managers will send out the RFP to a bunch of different uh, contractors. If you are making these repairs, James, um, as a result of your milestone inspection or your 40 or 50 year certification, your engineer will also bring some contractors to the table and say, hey, you should reach out to these folks. Then when the bids start coming in, a couple things you need to understand. The bids are part of the official records at that point. You open that bid, you look at it. That means that people in your community can also look at it. If you're required to have a website, you must put up a summary of that bid on the website. Now, we all know how owners sometimes like to get involved in the repair process. And a lot of boards say, well, we don't want them to look at the bids because we ourselves haven't made up our mind yet. Doesn't really matter. So that's where you're at in terms of getting the competitive bids, searching out the contractors. Yeah, I can add in here, maybe share the results. I, I'm really uh, encouraged by the result of question two here, Donna, how many of our audience mm -hmm. are proactively 
get, getting on these inspections. So uh, good for them. Um, yep. And uh, look, at we uh, management has a, a big role, you know, and we're going to talk in a minute about how big that role is. Obviously, we're not subject matter experts. We're not engineers. But we do work on these projects all 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 the time. We do uh, ha have a vendor community that we think are some are good and some are bad. Uh, one of the things we did about five years ago, Donna, was we created a a platform called Vendor Smart, and Vendor Smart. Mm -hmm. It the uh, the purpose of it was for property managers to go and find vendors, and to be on Vendor Smart, you had to be licensed, insured. There's a rating system. And then more recently, we've created an RFP function. So the manager can go on to VendorSmart, create an RFP using samples, and then they can edit it to, to their property. Um, so anyone, even not a Castle client, um, it can go to VendorSmart.com. And, and you may ask, why did we share it? In fact, we, we, we sold most of our interest in it because we wanted it to be independent. The quality of these uh, platforms are multiplied by the number of managers and the number of vendors on it because you just get more access to more. So we do have a tool in addition to Vendor Smart. Obviously, our managers will will own and getting the right RFP put together and processing that. But especially for our self managed communities, you know, you may not have those resources. So there's one that's free. It's online. You can use. Um, I think okay, that's a so that's a great tool. I think that's a great tool because. The last couple of boards I've met with, James, the people were brand new to Florida. So you've got a lot of board members who are, are completely new to Florida, and they don't even know where to begin to start looking for contractors. They, they're coming from other parts of the country or other parts of the world. So so a tool like that can be really useful. Yeah, it is. And, it, and with time, it's becoming better and better because we get more and more reference points, more and more managers, more and more projects. And, and obviously, the, the vendor, the cream of the vendors always rise to the top. Um, we had a one question that came up in one of your last comments, and I think it's it, it could be really important to our whole audience. So I'm gonna I'm gonna repeat it here. So uh, we had you mentioned railings. You know, you may have uh, knee walls, and you want to want to put in pretty glass. The question on the table is maybe we're out of compliance with current uh, code. So now we have to change because it's code driven. Do we still have to get an owner's approval, even if it's it's a material change? It's driven by code. Do I need owner approval? Great question. The answer is, is if, if it is a true compliance issue where the city or the county, local building official has said, hey, you have to put this in, then the answer is no. There are exceptions to the material alteration um, requirements. Remember, I'm not giving specific legal advice to anyone listening. Please get a get your own legal opinion. If it's if my clients are listening, call me or email. But there are exceptions to that material alteration requirement. But what we do find, James, is sometimes what people think is, you know, oh, we're being required to do this. Uh, get it in writing, if, if you believe. You know, uh, something that's been told to you verbally is not going to be sufficient. Uh, so make sure you get that in writing. But there are exceptions to the material requirement, um, to the material alteration requirements. The Condo X says 75% membership approval is needed for alterations to the common elements unless the governing documents specify a different percentage. Yeah, that's very high, 75, isn't it? I, I think we have a lot of our documents at two thirds. Yep. You must see that as well. Um, yeah, you know what? I must have skipped over my little uh, disclaimer here, Donna, about you not giving legal advice. So thanks for uh, saving me on that one. Okay, so now we've established our authority. We have uh, used our professionals and our property managers uh, to identify a specification for the job. Uh, we'll talk a bit about the engineer's role in that in a minute. And we've identified some uh, some vendors now we get bids come in and and what we do at castle obviously is everyone has to bid on the same form the same specification we usually assemble those into a spread you know a, sp a decision making spreadsheet we go to the board meeting uh, you know we'll often have a recommendation but it's not our decision it's the board's do you have any comment on like there's obviously price uh references um what, anything else that we could coach our audience today, Donna, on 
what criteria we would use to select uh, a vendor, a contractor? Yeah, I mean, well, first of all, I want to urge everybody listening that when you finally settle on a bid, please do not sign a contract without running it by legal first, okay? All of those contracts, regardless of the type of project you're doing, were prepared by the vendor's counsel. So those contracts, which contain a lot of boilerplate typically, it's, you know, it's one of two things, James, it's either, uh, you know, a 20 page AIA contract or it's a page and a half proposal, okay? So both of those are problematic. But I can tell you if you're signing any of those, either the AIA or the little proposal, they were designed to protect the contractor and not the association. So when you're looking at it, I think what you're referencing is the business terms. So the deal points, you know, when do we want the contract to start? You know, when do we want the project to start? When do we need it to end? What do we want to pay for it? What do we want the material and labor costs to be? Um, those are all business terms. Then you're going to want to send it over to us. And there's a lot of legal provisions I know we're going to talk about that should go into that contract. Again, a lot's going to come into it. You're not required to take the lowest bid. Um, again, after you do your due diligence and maybe you talk to a few different associations, you may decide that a particular contractor's vision or their reputation is the best fit for your community. And then your board and will communicate with counsel, here are the business terms we want, and then we'll tell you what legal terms need to be into that contract. Well, we're going to go into that section uh, uh, right now, but I, I do want to put up poll question three because I know... A lot of our audience may be having projects that aren't uh, necessarily legislatively driven. Uh, be interesting to see uh, that result. So Donna, uh, now we're gonna get into your wheelhouse here. And this is probably the most critical factor of this whole process is everything's gonna be driven off a contract. And uh, I really wanna talk about some of the elements that you want to make sure are in there. Obviously, people are going to go to their council for this, but I think it would be really good for our audience just to kind of understand some of the major necessary elements um, that you think should be in a contract. So can you start us off in that conversation? Let me start out with the most basic. Sometimes I see contracts for multi-million dollar projects and the name of the association is incorrect on the contract or the name of the contractor is incorrect. You need to start out and making sure that you are entering into a legally binding contract. I can tell you how many times there were mistakes in the very first paragraph. But when we're talking about the necessary, you know, really what I say, the most important uh, legal terms, I'll walk you through it. The deposit and progress payments need to be reasonable. So if you're dealing with a contractor who wants 50% more upfront, um, you're not going to have enough in retainage at the end to make it to make it uh, worthwhile for that contractor to stay on your project if there's problems. You know, if you've only got five or 10% left, they may decide that they need to move on to another project. Incidental damage. I, sure. I, I just want to pick up before you leave that point too. I think what you're saying is don't give them too much upfront. And I think that's good advice. And, but the, you mentioned something called retainage. Um, do you want to expand a, a little bit on that? I don't want to do a deep dive, but I'm not sure everyone would understand what retainage is. Sure. It's what you have left. So you even, when you make partial, you're going to have a, every contract is going to require some upfront money, some deposits. Then there's going to be progress payments made along the way, particularly when we're talking, James, about contracts that are going to span many months, sometimes even multiple years, depending on how large the community is. So you'll have progress payments. You will only make those payments when your owner's rep, we haven't gotten into that yet, your owner's rep inspects the work and signs off. You may want to retain a little bit. Retainage at the end basically just means you should have at least 20%, preferably 25% at the very end when the project um, passes final inspection. That's really your leverage. Yeah, I agree. I, this is why I asked you to stop there because if, if we don't have money do the contractor you may not have a contractor um uh and yeah. let's share the they results of uh yeah, let's share the results of question three i'm really again encouraged by this and, and i'm not surprised because if you're on this if you're on this webinar you probably have some interest in projects but just look at how much work our communities under the supervision of our boards are doing it's it's phenomenal 
Too bad the pay of being a board member is so terrible. Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, let's uh, let's put that out of the way. Okay. I, I cut you off there, but you were on payments and deposits. And uh, what what's the next element of a contract we should make sure is in there? You might want to have incidental damage clause. And this is really important, particularly with painting, roofing, concrete restoration, all of these large projects, things happen, right? So hurricane shutters have usually sliding glass doors, sometimes windows have to be removed. These are so you'll want an incidental or consequential damage clause. Liquidated damages, James. I talked about multiple, you know, projects that span many months or years. You want, you know, notwithstanding acts of God, what we call force majeure, you want to make sure that your contractor is going to consistently show up for your project. Again, sometimes, you know, they're looking at your project, but now there's a, a potential client over here and they're going to move their crew over to that new project and they're kind of going to swing back and forth. A liquidated damage clause, which ties them to a completion date, otherwise they suffer certain daily penalties, is one way to make sure, you know, keep your contractor honest about working consistently on your project. Um, insurance is a huge one. Donna, we lost you a bit on incidental damages. Can you just repeat what incidental damages are? Sure. Sure. And I apologize. I am in the middle of a very large storm. So if I come in and out, that's that's what's happening here. So incidental or consequential consequential damages, that clause is important because there are components that could get damaged in the course of the project, whether it's shutters, whether it's uh, glass or sliding glass doors, somebody has to pay for that. Now, the other um, clause that's really important in your contracts is insurance. What kind of insurance does your contractor have? Do they have workers' comp? Do they have commercial general liability? Do they have commercial auto liability? Do they have excess or umbrella coverage? Because the indemnification clause and the incidental damage clause are only as good as the insurance policies they have in place to back that up. Uh, I would like to see a payment or performance bond in place in these contracts. So if your contractor has a, has a problem and walks off your job or goes bankrupt, You've got a bond in place to finish up that, that project. Um, waiving 558 chapter, we've talked before, and I know um, you've done webinars on 558, which is the Florida statute that deals with destructive testing. That's usually used for new construction, James, but they stick it in a lot of these repair contracts. There's no reason you can't negotiate to have your contractor waive 558 compliance. So if there's a problem, you don't have any impediment to going straight to court to, to exercise your rights. I talked about indemnification. Warranty is a big one. Obviously, you're paying a lot. You want to make sure you've got a sufficient warranty provision. A hurricane plan. We've got a six-month hurricane season here in Florida. So you're going to want your repair project to have a clause that deals with what's going to happen to all the materials, what's going to happen to the, the progress of the work. If a hurricane comes, huge one, right to set off. I can't tell you, and I'm sure you hear it too. Hey, we don't want to pay the rest of this. We just talked about retainage because they didn't, they, they're not doing this, this work properly. If you have a right to set off into your contract, you can do that safely. If you don't have a right to set off, you may wind up with a, a, a contractor's mechanic lien filed on your property, which is a problem. Um, and lastly, I like to see an ability to terminate if the material costs exceed 15% of the cost referenced in the contract. Let me repeat that. A lot of times when with these huge projects, the material costs go up. And if you don't have language in your documents, in your contract protecting the association, the contractor is just going to pass that along to you regardless of cost. So you may want to be able to terminate that contract if you think the material costs are being inflated. Well, I'm going to go back up a little bit on this. This is really good. Uh, there was a question that came in about penalties, you know, so that you can have some teeth in the contract. I think that's in the kind of liquidated damages wording of the contract. That's where you would put what uh, performance penalties, correct? Yes. And, and, and just to tie this into a neat circle, 
getting back to how do we pick the contractor is the contractor's willingness to be flexible with these contract terms, James, may tip the balance in favor of one contractor or over another. So if you're dealing with a contractor and you say, look, we need these protections and one contractor is open to that and another is rigid and says, this is our contract, take it or leave it, that may be, that may be the tipping point. Well, I think this is a good point. Point. I even when you award, you you know, you choose the winner. We choose you subject to successful negotiation of the contracts. And if we're not successful, we're going to the next bidder. Uh, we talked about insurance, and that's a very interesting um, element of the contract, Donna. In that, insurance levels sometimes will vary depend on, on the size of the job. It's really not necessarily an expertise our boards would necessarily have. Should we get either our attorney or our insurance agent involved to help us with insurance limits in those contracts? Absolutely. I think you need to get involved because you need to know whether you know you need to know whether your contractor has sufficient sufficient coverage in place should the worst scenario happen. And, and, and then you need to look at your, the association needs to look at their coverage to see whether or not that's going to come into play. So to answer your question, I think you need to get both counsel and your insurance agent involved. We, you know, you can't just pull numbers out of the air and stick it in the addendum. You need to make sense, right? I think this is really important because uh, not only do you want to make sure the contract has uh, obligations of the contractor's insurance, but we want our association's insurance agent to look at it in light of this project going on to make sure our coverages don't need any adjustment. Uh, I just wanted to pause on that because I think this is a, things are great when contracts go well. When they don't go well, you start looking for damage clauses and insurance uh, provisions. Well, that, you know, on that point, a lot of associations will sign contracts with indemnification clauses requiring the association to indemnify a party. If they're doing that without reaching out to insurance to their insurance agent and saying, hey, do we have coverage? We just agreed to indemnify this person, this entity. Do we have coverage for it? That's an important part of the equation and one that's often overlooked. It's interesting. We have an, uh, our, our Q&A board, which is not going to get to all of them, Donna, but it's lighting up as we kind of get into experiences of boards who are in our audience today, you know, where... They haven't held back money, and the contractors way delayed, and 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 now they're into um, obviously some whatever they can do to enforce the provisions of that contract. But I, I think, look, I really think you need some great legal advice at the front end of the contract. But I think the moment things start getting off the, the rails, I, I also think you should get your counsel to make sure we're doing all the things that we need to do to to, to maximize the outcome that we're going to get from that. Um, you mentioned performance bonds and uh, maybe explain what that means. So um, if I have a performance bond, because there's a cost, uh, the contractor will add the cost of the bond into the contract. Explain what a performance bond is for our audience, Donna. So there's two. It's basically an insurance policy, James. It's a payment or performance bond, and it does exactly what the title says. If you run into a, pro a problem on the project, your contractor walks off, a payment bond will pay you, will give you money so you can go hire someone else. Same thing with a performance bond will have come in and, and a contractor will perform the rest of the project. Listen, why do you want this in place? Because if you don't have a payment or performance bond and you get into a tussle with your contractor and they leave, you know what happens when you get a, a replacement contractor in? They know they kind of have you over a barrel, right? They come out and they see a 40% completed project. Guess what happens to their estimate? It goes up. So everything's negotiable. I like to say this. Everything's negotiable. So who's going to pay for the permits? Who's going to pay for the payment or performance bond? That's a negotiation point. If contractor wants your business bad enough, maybe they'll pay for it. Maybe not. Maybe you'll pay for it. But these are, these are topics that you're going to want to negotiate. You mentioned 558, and I think most of us are familiar with the 558 process in a new building to make sure that when we take over control of the building from the developer, everything as it should be. But I think the provisions that you're talking about are that they've actually uh, passed some legislation that 
um, tries to smooth out how these five five eight disputes are uh, mediated. Um, and what you're suggesting is you don't want to go through that process on a contract like this. Uh, maybe just expand a little bit on that one. So many people listening probably deal with my partner, Steve Lesser, who, who chairs our construction defect department. Um, Steve yeah. was the former ABA chair of construction law. He routinely puts in there a waiver of 558 again because Chapter 558 was passed um, at the behest of the builder's lobby in Florida, which is a very powerful lobby. And what it, it's designed to basically pump the brakes and say, you got to send out notice, you got to allow us to do, you know, destructive testing. This can take months. And, you know, again, for new construction, that's one thing. But if we want a roof, if we paid, you know, a couple million dollars to put a roof on, we don't want to spend six months, you know, haggling with the contractor. We want to go forward and be able to exercise our rights and say, we contracted for this work, we paid for it, now we want you to deliver. So again, another negotiation point. But this is where this is where council comes in, um, in terms of negotiating with the contractor. And look, some contractors are rigid. They'll say, take it or leave it. In which case, keep looking because you'll probably find somebody who's going to be a little more reasonable. Yeah, I, I just want to highlight that we don't want five five eight clauses in these in the non developer turnover clauses. Okay, and then Not a couple here. more quick ones. Sorry. A couple no, more I wanted. That's... It's not in our best interest. So uh, the warranty provisions, I, I think, are really critical. It obviously depends completely on the nature of the project we're doing, but you know, using our roof, uh, you know, the, you, you want to make sure warranties are very specific in these agreements before we get started on the job. Uh, and then right of set off, I, uh, my experience, Donna, is that's a tough one to get in with these contractors. They do not want to write a set off uh, clause. So maybe just give us a, a snippet on what that is and what's the likelihood of us getting a write a set off in one of these contracts. Well, you're right. Uh, they don't like it because it's, it's, it's very much in the association's interest. And they, I think the fear on most contractors part is it's going to be used. It's going to be a weapon that's, you know, wielded in an arbitrary or capricious manner. But you can you can draft your council can draft a very tight set off clause, which which sets certain you know guardrails around it. I understand it from the contractor's perspective. This is where your owner's rep is going to come into play. It's not the board that's going to make this decision. The board is going to rely on the professional opinion of the owner's rep to say this work is not up to snuff. It doesn't meet. It doesn't comply with the code. It doesn't comply with what our what we contracted for, so you can't. We cannot pay for this particular work. So your selection of an owner's rep, which honestly I think needs to be a third party or an engineer, James, not you know, not you know, uh, Susan sitting on the board who you know volunteered to be the owner's rep. This really needs to be somebody with savitas. But a, a right of setup will basically in the contract say if you don't pass our owner's rep's approval. Uh, we're we're going to, we have the ability not to pay you and you can't sue us for breach of contract in doing so. That's the real issue here. You don't have to be on the receiving end of a lawsuit from the contractor. Well, I, uh, if we can get it, we should get it. Okay. Um, I want to cover uh, contractor documents, funding and project management. We have 15 minutes. So um, I don't know that we need to do a deep dive into the contract documents, but maybe just kind of go from Notice to owner, notice commencement. What what are the documents? Kind of these are half dues uh, when we're yeah. managing a contract. So we get a lot of these James as registered agent. If the notice to owner is required. They will record it in the public records, and basically the GC is putting you on notice. Association board, we're starting this along with the notice of commencement. This project is starting. There's going to be a bunch of subcontractors and suppliers working on the project. This document is actually for the association's protection as well, because you want to make sure that your GC is paying all your suppliers and your subcontractors. Anybody who does work, who performs improvements on your real property is entitled under Florida law to file and record a lien against your property if they, if they are not paid. So you want to pay close attention to who's coming in and, and working on the property. This is where your management professionals will come into play as well. Partial releases of lien 
You don't want to just be tendering, you know, payment over to the contractor and that's it. You're going to want to make sure on these big repair and maintenance projects and improvement projects that you are doing this correctly, that you're getting the owner's rep to sign off, that when you're tendering payment, you are getting the contractor to sign partial releases of lien each time. And then finally, the final payment would be the contractor's final affidavit and release of lien, where that GC is saying, look, I've paid everybody on this project. There should be nobody coming out from behind the bushes that's not paid who can record a lien on your property. Yeah, I, I mean, I can't say enough. Obviously, the, the uh, notice owner and the notice commencement, they're going to be done because the contractor needs to protect uh, their interest um, for payment. But the partial releases, the, the, the final affidavit and the final release of lien, this is on us. We got we cannot make those last payments until all of those things are in hand. And that's why I mentioned earlier, Donna, I, I really think counsel at the beginning of the contract is, it, it, you know, sets it up right. And, and you don't make that final payment until you've con consulted counsel at the end of the contract. Uh, during okay. the contract, you may be asked, James, as, as, as units close, because these, remember, these projects span many months, sometimes more than a year. As contracts close, you may be asked, the uh, board may be asked to sign what's called an affidavit of sufficient funds. So that's something to talk to council as well. They want to make sure that you've got money to pay for this project. Yeah, especially if with what's going on right now. In fact, this you've segued me. I think we teed did this up. I want to talk about funding, and uh, we will get uh, contractors, especially the you know big reputable ones. They know they're going to do the job. They know they're going to do it well. They want to make sure they're going to get paid. Uh, all right. So I want to put up the last poll question, uh, Ness, so we can see how our audience plans to fund the projects. And while we uh, do have those results come in, Donna, you know, I, 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 I love oversimplifying. Um, how do I fund a project? You've got cash in the bank and that could be reserves or operating. Um, you can do a special assessment, that dirty word in our business. Uh, you can borrow the money uh, or you can do a hybrid uh, of all of that. Um, the one thing that I, you know, we're dealing a lot with our clients right now. And, you know, my partner, Craig Vaughn, is really, really good at this. What we're trying to do is get the work done that we have to get done and smooth the impact on, on the owners because it can be quite shocking. Uh, and what we find is using a certain amount of cash and um, uh, borrowing a certain amount of money and then doing a, a special assessment. That can often be a hybrid is the best way, the best outcome. But before I, I, I dive into that, any other comments on those uh, tools that we have in the toolbox to fund these projects? Hey, listen, it's a policy decision, Jane, but uh, right now I'm dealing with a lot of boards who are struggling with that issue. Do we take a loan? Um, do we just pass a special assessment and leave it up to the owners to get their own funding? You know, right now owners are saying you're breaking our backs. But so I've got boards that are saying, maybe we take a loan and maybe that helps our owners. Um, if obviously, we've got reserves for the roof or for painting or paving or any of these projects. You should tap into your reserves. That's why you put them away. That's why you put them away was for these kind of projects. So it really is a policy decision. And then the issue is um, if the association is going to take a, a, a loan, how do they do they want to um, do they want to benefit owners who can pay in one lump sum and let the other ones uh, pay the carrying costs? Oh, I see we've got our poll answers. Reserve, yeah, special um, session. Yeah. You know, that again, that's that's not a surprise. It brings up a question, though. I'm not sure it's on the board or it's in my head, but can I use reserves for con a roof to, to do my concrete restoration project? I'm looking for cash anywhere now, Donna. How do I take the cash I have and maybe use it in a project that it wasn't intended for? How do I do that? So, you know, Senate Bill 154, which was the glitch bill, now changed the percentage needed to use reserve funds for non-reserve purposes from a majority of a quorum. You now need a majority of the total membership. Now, any budget passed after uh, 1231-24 for structural components you will not be able to use a structural component reserve 
for another purpose. So in other words, you can't take your SIRS money and use it for, you know, uh, an elevator refurbishment, okay? You could, you know, so this requires a legal opinion, but for right now, for any budget right now, you can still get a membership vote to say, hey, I've got a lot of money sitting for painting, but I have a roof project I need to do. If you've got it in straight, not straight line accounts, if you have it in a pooled account, James, then that's cash flow funding. You can take out of that pooled account and use it as long as you replenish the funds for the next component that comes up for replacement. Yeah, that's why I'm a big fan of pooled funds. It just provides that flexibility. Mm -hmm. But I think the, the major point here, Donna, is you can't, I mean, reserve funds are often designated and you cannot move them without a, a an owner vote. By the way, you're probably going to get the owner vote because they don't want to be special assessed. So you do have some incentive here. Yeah. Okay. Um, the uh, other thing, we had a question about what do loans cost now? Because the loan was a great, for the last five years, the cost of loans have been so low that it's, it was actually a very attractive offer. Um, but I was talking to Craig uh, before we came in here. He's seeing the loans go at seven and a half to eight and a half percent now. So that's now a factor in these, you know, uh, special assess versus borrow. Okay. We got, um, I want to, anyways, obviously, what, what all of our audience, if you um, if you have to fund this, there's a number of different ways and a number of hybrids and obviously our, ourselves and, and and the people in the management business are quite good at this. Um, so I, I think that's as far as we're going to go for today, Donna. But I, I, I do want to talk about um, how do we manage these projects? And we often get, well, can't Castle your manager do that or do we in, need an engineer or do we need an owner's rep or do we uh do we have a full-time project manager and and i'll just start the answer this way donna in most cases of a material uh a, co a job your property manager it's probably above their pay scale and, and 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 i say that not to insult any of the managers but look we have some unbelievable managers that have come up the maintenance side of the business and they probably could do it and we have some unbelievable managers who come up through the hospitality business and they, they just make a beautiful environment to live in but you probably don't want them managing your your construction project and then we have some incredible managers that have financial minds so um in general i don't recommend you have your on-site manager being the one they have a full-time job doing what they were supposed to do Right. Um, so uh, maybe I'll just let, uh, let you comment on that. Do you agree with that perspective? Oh, 100%. I mean, your manager still has to collect the assessments, pay the invoices, deal, deal with the, uh, the, the random owners ambling into the association office with a list of questions. I mean, the emails don't stop. The phone calls don't stop. You want somebody that uh, you want an owner's, that's their job. Okay, that's their job to oversee this project. And again, it's really going to be dependent, James, on the type of project. But any large, any large concrete restoration project is going to require an outside owner's rep, in my opinion. The same thing if you're dealing with multiple roofs and a roofing project and painting. What uh, I talked to Will Delgado, who's our president, COO, and you know he he came from the building side of the business, and I just bumped into yeah. him all, and I I asked for you know what threshold do we want to get uh, an engineer or an owner's rep or full-time project manager? And um, I thought, uh, I thought he was a lawyer the way he answered it. Donna. No, I'm just kidding. He was sitting on the <laughs> fence, but the, the two words he said were, were scale. In other words, that could be measured in dollars and complexity. Uh, that would really drive the need for an outside. And, but he said, look at, you could probably save the cost of an engineer, project manager, owner rep in savings in the project. He really believes it's a false economy to not do that. And the only other comment he had was, um, it doesn't have to be full-time. You know, you there are lots of uh, project management, engineer, owner rep companies out there that'll they'll scale the support to, to the extent that you want to put in your budget. That's true. That's very yep. true. Okay. Um, that Now, we didn't talk about permitting. We have a, only a few minutes left, but what... Um, what about permitting? Who's responsible for that? Depends on what the contract says. Normally the contractor. The contract. uh, yeah. I, I like it on the, on the, 
the contractor's in a better position than your volunteer board to know what permits are required, what the code requires are. You know, I would never suggest having a volunteer board be responsible to make those decisions. Make sure that your contract says that your contractor is responsible and that the work they're providing complies with all federal and local uh, code requirements and that they obtain the permits. They're in well, the best position where, to know what's. This is where, again, I, I'm not selling, I don't have any financial interest in project management or engineers or owner ups. Uh, and by the way, those, those terms can be used interchangeably, but um, you don't have to be an engineer to be a, a project manager or owner's sure. rep. I use project manager, owner's rep kind of interchangeably. Um, but they know what permitting is required. They know what inspections are required and, and they know what um, sign-offs we need from the, the uh, municipalities before we can go ahead and, and use the asset. The last piece I have is a communication. And I know it's not really a, a, a legal question, but I just think that the success of a project from a community point of view is really good, transparent communication between the board and the owners uh, and, and, and manager communicating stages. OK, we're going to do this side of the building. You know, we're going to be locking the doors of of, of your balconies in this stack. Um, so I, I, that's you know, that was kind of the last element I put in this administering a project was just being a great communicator. Uh, with the owners. Comments, Donna? Well, and, and yes, it's it's crucial to communicate, but even with that communication, I can't tell you how often we are contacted because an owner is not being cooperative. They may, you know, you may, your contractor may need to put staging equipment on that balcony and the owner saying not happening. And again, legal gets involved and we have to let the owner know, no, actually that's limited common element and we'll be putting staging equipment on your balcony. So I do think to your point, the more you can kind of prime the pump and let people know, but as you well know, occasionally we run into people in some of these communities, no matter how much advanced communication, they're just not reasonable uh, when it comes to the project, so. Excellent. Well, Donna, this has been great. I really wanted to kind of walk through the, the life cycle of a, uh, of a project and uh, there was no intent in this one hour webinar to really deep dive, but I'm, I'm hoping we've got our, our our audience making some notes about elements that that they better make sure are in their next project. So you've been great as always and just kind of giving us the checks and balances. There's a lot of legal. You do not want to start one of these projects without, you know, your favorite uh, legal advisor on board at the front and at the end. So Donna, final word is yours. Otherwise, we're uh, we're gonna see you uh, probably in January. Yeah, just great to be back. Happy holidays, everyone. And never, ever, ever sign a proposal without getting it reviewed. That's my final word. Thanks so much, James. Thank you, everybody. And uh, you can see our contact information on the screen. By midnight tonight, we'll have this webinar up at uh, castagroup.com. Uh, we are so grateful uh, for you today as audience, but more importantly, for what you're doing your, for your community. So thanks again. Hope you found this uh, very valuable, and uh, we'll talk to you uh, in the new year. Thank you. Happy holidays, everybody. Thanks, Donna.